All right, you guys, as you can see by the thumbnail, this is going to be something a little bit different. So check this out, you guys. Before I jump into this video, I want to start out by saying a couple of things real quick. So a lot of the information, a lot, a lot of the content that I put out, the inner demons, the war stories, the profiles, the Q&As, a lot of that stuff is based on my experiences first-hand knowledge, things that I've personally lived through or I was there to see it happen. Sometimes I put out content that's based off of something that I seen in the media, maybe something that came out on the internet, something like that. But most of it is based on first-hand knowledge. Now, you know, in the past, there's individuals that I've plugged in with that share information with me, let me know what's going on in the feds. They let me know what's going on in the state or just out there in the streets. Just stories or things that I know you guys will be interested in hearing about. Now, none of us as content creators can say that everything that we put out is absolutely 100% accurate. We never make no mistakes. It happens. It's happened to me in the past before. I relied on somebody else to relay information to me and I, I jumped on and put it out there and come to find out the facts were all mixed up and things weren't the way that I put it out. And I ended up taking the flag for it in the comments. No, nah, that's not true. V, that didn't happen this way. It didn't happen like that. Just, you know, your information is, is, is bogus and your credibility is in question. And you guys are, are ruthless when it comes to that, which is understandable. We're talking about real people, real events and people's, in some cases, people's careers. So I understand the seriousness of it, but we all we all go through it. Renegade Media is going through it right now. You know, I'm, I I seen that he put a story out and come to find out he didn't really vet that story. And, you know, he's taking the flack for it, but he did, he did his due diligence and he did his damage control and he's cool. You know, I believe that he, he's, he's good with his viewers now. And, you know, it, it, it happens. You know, we try to get the best information that we can, but sometimes it happens. Anyway, my point is this. So for me, IG has become a very helpful resource as far as meeting people and, you know, tapping in with people that, that want to share things, whether it's something that happened out there on the streets or the same kind of content. And recently I tapped in with a Sureño. That happened to be an active surrender. We just reached out through IG. We started vibing. Once we established that, you know, that that communication and there was a little bit of trust there, he started to open up and he started to talk about things and share things. His experiences were around the same age. We were doing time at the same time. He's a lifer. So he's been down around 20 years. But since I've been talking to him and we've been building you know, this rapport, this relationship between each other, he started opening up and sharing stories. His whole thing, even though he is 100% active on an active level four yard right now, his thing is, hey, we all get tired. We all get tired of the way that leadership functions, the things that they have us do out there on these yards right now, the, the policies, the changes, it, it all gets old. And at some point, you know, we get, we get older and we just get tired to the point of, you know, his, his whole thing now is he just wants to put out positive messages for the kids, for the youngsters that are gravitating, you know, to that lifestyle. Anyway, he offered to start sharing some of his experiences. So what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to convey some of those experiences to you guys through him. Now, the reason why, you know, I opened up with this right here is because I want to I want to make it very clear that, you know, these stories, at least the ones that are coming from him, I can't stamp them. I can't put my name on them because I wasn't there. This is stuff that's being relayed to me. So this right here, this is your guys' disclaimer right here. Just know that, you know, I trust this individual. He sounds like a straight up dude. He don't sound like no, no, no dummy. He sounds like somebody that's been around. And I can tell, you know, by talking to somebody, what type of individual that they are. And he sounds like a solid individual that's been around some solid people. So this story right here that I'm going to tell you guys the story that he shared with me. And basically what it is, it's, so what this story is about, it's about 
Essentially, it's about the first two Mexican mafia members that hit Ironwood right after the Todd Asker, Danny Troxel civil suit, right after they opened up the shoe programs and let everybody out, all the leadership. So bear in mind, you know, we, we talked about this situation and, you know, I, I got a, a feel of it coming from, you know, the other side, the Sureños, how, how they were looking at things. And it's it's kind of crazy because I got one perspective of how it was for us. Although I wasn't out there for the agreement to end hostilities, I can still put myself in that environment. I've been around, you know, when the other two peace treaties were talked about back in the shoe in the 90s. So, you know, talking to them about it, I got a good feel of where they were coming from, their mindset, the things that they were talking about when all this was coming to fruition. And that's what I'm going to work Hopefully, that's what I'm going to be able to convey to you guys. So this is the thing. So I'm going to tell you guys the story. But at the same time, I was asking them questions because I wanted a little bit more insight about some of the specifics, some of the things that I was real curious about, what their plans were. Did they have any kind of, you know, ulterior motives? What were they being told? What were the filters, you know, what were the filters saying that were coming from their leadership? You know, what, what kind of policies were they implementing out there on the yards and why certain things were happening? So basically, this is this is what he conveyed to me. So right after the Danny Troxel and the Todd Asker lawsuit came to fruition, they started cutting people loose. Back there in the shoe, everybody's back there in Pelican Bay. They're letting people go slowly. And the first ones that they let go first were the associates, not the actual validated leaders and the gang members, but the, the associates, those that they had identified as being associates. So they let these guys out first. And a lot of these guys, you know, they were some of them were level two, some of them were level threes, level fours. They started sending them out to different pens. After they let these guys out, that's when they actually started letting out the, the leaders, the leadership, and some of the validated members from the different groups. Now, there was still a lot of prisons in the in the beginning that, you know, at one point in time, there were there were no North Daniels at some of these prisons. There were policies for the Sureños, for the Mexican Mafia, that no North Daniels were allowed to walk those main lines. If they did, they would get blasted. So it was, the transition was a little... It was slow going, but eventually as leadership started getting there, as more people started landing on some of these yards, these policies started being implemented from the Mexican mafia and the NF. Now, this story right here that I'm gonna tell you guys about, it happened in Ironwood. And this Southsider was one of the first, he was on one of the first buses that was en route to Ironwood when all this was happening. So basically, he got cut loose with a couple other, you know, some other Sureños. And then you had two Mexican Mafia members that were on that same bus. And that was Chato from Laverne and Raul from, from Wilmington. I don't know their first names. That's all, I, that's all I know. Chato from Laverne and Raul from Wilmington. Now, Raul went to another yard. He ended up on the same yard with Chato from Laverne. And, you know, it was a trip, just him explaining the details of, of how this happened. They get there, they get to this prison, and it's it's all hyped up. Everybody's all hyped up on the yard. All these Southsiders out there are tripping because everybody, everybody heard that these guys are going to be coming out of the shoot program, and nobody believed it. According to him, he told me that nobody believed that they were actually going to let these guys come out there. Real, bona fide Mexican Mafia members. NF members, ABs, BGF, like it wasn't going to happen. But everybody was hyped up about it. Now, when this bus hit the yard, when these guys ended up actually hitting the yard, like I said, Raul went to another yard and he went out there with Chato from Laverne. He said that when they were walking through the yard, these Sureños, everybody that was on the yard was, was basically, they were you know, intrigued, they were mesmerized by this guy walking through the yard that was a Mexican mafia member. You heard, you know, you heard whispers like, man, that that's that's 
that's a carnale right there. You know what I mean? I mean, what I think about is I think about my first experience when I ran into a an NF member. It was the same thing for us. I heard a lot of things about these NF members, and you know, they, they were talked about as if they were like gods. So when I actually ran into one, there was a little bit of of you know, you're intimidated a little bit because this is these are individuals that you've heard a lot about. And they move, walk, and talk a different way than what you, you're used to seeing. They they do. A lot of them are very militant. A lot of them are, are very disciplined. And they just, they conduct themselves a different way. So anyways, you know, he's telling me that, you know, this guy's walking through the yard and, and these guys are looking at him like, damn, like they're melting out there. They're tripping like, damn, this this is really a, 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 a carnale right here. Some of them are like, really? This, this is who we take orders from, you know, because in some situations, like Dancing Bear is a, a prime example. A lot of young North Daniels will hear all this stuff about bona fide NF members. And then when they see somebody like Dancing Bear, they're like, you're kidding me. That's that's a canale right there. That's who we've been taking. I mean, you, you look at some of these guys, these little four foot two Danny DeVito baloney patch wearing you know what i'm saying and and some of them just don't have that look you know when, when you think about a carnale at least myself when back in the day when i used to think about how an nf member was supposed to look the perfect prototype to me was some some cat that was a huge cat this cat was big yoked up big old whip sleeve down and just just had that look you know what I mean? To me, that's what a carnale was supposed to look like. But like I said, you run into these Danny DeVito looking cats that you're just like, man, come on, you're kidding. But anyway, so they hit the yard. He's out there. This guy Chato's out there. And right away, Chato starts going to work. He hits the yard. He hits the yard running. Like he's finding out who's who, where's what, what's going on out there, how much dope's out there, who got cell phones. Like he's he gets right in. So as, you know, he's getting himself acclimated out there and, and, you know, he's establishing his yard now. It didn't take, by the end of that night, probably, he found out where every cell phone was at, who had the dope. He probably had the dope in the cell already. And he knew everything that was going on out there. So the other thing that, you know, the other point that he really, he emphasized was the fact that a lot of these carnales that got out, some of them were back in the shoe for 20, 30, 40 years. A lot of these guys, you got to understand their mindset. They've been locked up, stranded back there in the shoe program. They got no resources or very little resources. They don't really get any canteen. They don't see anybody back there. It's They're very limited. And I know that myself because I've been back there. Now they're out here with cell phones, with dope, with I mean, there's, it's like, it, it just doesn't get no better than that. If you're a lifer and you hit a main line like this, there's so many privileges that you're just not used to having and you have all that now. There's no way in hell you're going to allow anything or anybody to get you to go back to the shoe program. You're not going to let nobody mess up out there. You're going to make sure the homies and, and anybody else out there that there's there's no bloodshed or nothing because you know that it basically falls back on you. The administration, they're sitting back. They don't really know what's going on. He said, you know, the administration themselves were kind of like just sitting back watching because they didn't know what was going to happen. They didn't know what, what these guys were going to do once they hit the yard, what the Northanians and the Surangers were going to do. They heard a lot about this you know, agreement to end hostilities, but they still didn't know if this was a ploy or if this was real, if they were going to really come out there and kick back. So they're, they're kicking back watching and, you know, they're, I'm sure they were on top of this guy Chato, just like they were every other NF, AB, Mexican mafia member that hit any prison. Now this was happening all over. Slowly they started bleeding these guys out to different prisons, different prisons, you know, and I, I want to say the way he he described it to me, there was some strategy to it. They were sending a lot of the, the NF members to prisons where the Northanios had a heavy presence out there. Some of these prisons, like I told you guys, that, you know, Northanios weren't allowed 
to be at, at, you know, at one time. And I mean that by, you know, like this, not that there was a rule in place where Norteños couldn't go do their time, but the, the Sureños, if a Norteño came out there to the yard, they whack them. They weren't allowed to be out there. They had standing orders to hit them. And the Norteños, they had the same orders. There's some prisons that weren't established. They didn't have their names on those yards. So they were told, hey, you got so much time to go out there and handle your business. And more than likely, they were going to do that anyway because they wouldn't have any time to, to, to get out there and get established or situated before they sent a squad at them anyway. So they were going to end up getting off. But, you know, he tells me Chato gets out there and Chato already starts delegating positions. He, he, he you know, he establishes a mess out there because they have a different type of leadership out there now. The Sureños, at least as far as I know, they, they never really functioned under a leadership hierarchy out there on the yard. They might have had like, Blaqueros and, and, and you know, Yaveros, guys that had the keys or, or just kind of like a little bit of leadership out there. But now they have mesas, they have councils, they have, they're, they're a little bit more leadership based. I'd rather say it like that. I don't want to say that they weren't, they didn't fall up under a leadership, you know, a chain of command. But I'll just say that now it sounds like it's more leadership based than it was when I was out there. So, you know, Chato starts to establish himself on that yard and starts implementing his policies. One of his policies were that if you got a visitor and that visitor came up, I want to say it was three or four times after the fourth time, she was required to bring Glavo in. She had to bring in Glavo, otherwise, you weren't allowed to visit. The One of the other policies, and, and let me say this before I get to all those policies. The other thing that he really, you know, that we talked about is when this agreement to end hostility was all being ironed out, you know, he told me that there was a lot of Sureños that weren't on board with it. They didn't like it. It's the same way, and I told him this, this is, it was the same way for us. There was a lot, a lot of Norteños, a lot of carnales, a lot of hermanos that were all saying, hey, man, you know, I didn't sign up for this. You know what I mean? What about all the brothers that spilled their blood? What about all the sacrifices that we made? What about all that? So all that was for nothing. Now that you guys come out to the yards and you guys are facing consequences now, or now that you guys might end up going back to the, to the oil, now you want to start implementing all these policies and start, you know, stopping the war. You guys want to put an end to the war. A lot of them were saying, man, this, this, this right here is some bullshit. A lot of them weren't really on board with it, but they got in line because they had to. And it was the same way for the North Daniels. A lot of them didn't like it, but at the end of the day, they can talk in the cell to their celly all they want about it until they're blue in the face. But coming out, saying something, speaking on it to leadership or acting like they had a problem with it would just get them removed. So most of the time they just kept their mouth shut. So that was that was something that was across the board on both sides. They had to get through this period where there was a lot of Sureños and a lot of Norteños that just didn't want to be out there. They didn't like it. They didn't like the setup. They'd be out there on the yard and they'd just kind of be watching. And a lot of them had a bad taste in their mouth. like. You know, this ain't cool. I don't like this. You know, but again, they had to comply with the program. Either you conform or you get got. That's that's how it goes. And again, these guys, you got to understand, put yourself in their in their shoes. They spent all this time in the shoe program. They had very little privileges. Getting a visit was probably the best thing that happened to you back there. And that's after somebody drove three, four hundred miles to come see you. And it lasted for an hour, and that's it. Maybe canteen once a month. That was all you were going to get back there. Yard, the law library. Those were the only things you really had to look forward to. Your TV, your radio. But now they're out there on the main line. They can go to canteen. They get all kind of stuff on canteen. There's there's drugs out there. There's, there's cigarettes. There's tobacco. They got cell phones. So it's like... Some of them probably didn't even know how to act. And this is this is also on the heels of being up there in the shoe program, 
you guys got to understand this. I've said this before. The shoe program in Pelican Bay is so massive. It's so big and spread out between two facilities. You got 22 units. It's so big that you could be up there for 10 or 15 years and you might know somebody that's in another block and never see him that entire time because you very rarely come out of your block. You're not going to be coming in and out of your block too much. If you do, there's something wrong. You might come out once every few months. Maybe if you're going to the law library, that's the only reason you're coming out or to a visit. Otherwise, you're not going to really see nobody up there. Trust me on that. So that was one of the things that, that Chato implemented was, you know, about the visiting. He wanted to start getting his drugs. That was the first thing that he did was to lock down and establish a policy that made sure that he was going to get an abundance of drugs, that they were going to, the drugs were going to come in. If they were getting visits, they were going to come in. The other thing that he did that really caused a lot of pushback out there was that if you weren't nobody, and this was according to this individual that I spoke to, if you weren't somebody of status, if you weren't really somebody that was a camarada or somebody that was really part of the leadership, you were just a regular, just a regular sureño, you were being made to give up your cell phone. And I want to say the purpose that he said for that is because, you know, it was, it caused a lot of interference. It created interference. They weren't part of what was going on there. They were just in the way. They took those privileges from them. He didn't really make it clear why they were taking them. But again, if they weren't part of the leadership, they weren't a camarada, something like that, they were taking their cell phones. Now, most of the most of these guys comply. And put yourself in their shoes, though. You know, you're out there. This The cell phone is the best thing that happens to these guys that are out there on the main lines, to any of them. Because a lot of the times, you know, you want to talk on the phone openly, freely, the way you want to talk, when you want to talk. And you can't do that if you don't got a cell phone. You have to sign up for the phone, the phone that's the recorded phone that they have in the prison. You get a time slot and everybody signs up. So, you know, you might get to talk once or maybe if you're lucky twice a day. But it's that inconvenience right there of being able to, you know, only talk for so long or just not being able to, to speak freely. You, you want to talk business on the phone. You can't do it because it's being recorded. So having a cell phone, you know, so where you can call your, your wife anytime you want to call her, FaceTime them, you know, call your, 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 your Sacha or whatever, your kids or the homies out there where you're talking business and there's no threat of, you know, the phone being recorded, that's pretty huge. So for the most part, when... Most of these sureños were told to give up their cell phones. Mostly all of them comply because they knew what time it was if they didn't. If you debate or there's any kind of pushback, you're just going to get stabbed, period. People know that Mexican Mafia, the NF, these organizations don't have patience for insubordination. So if you're somebody that's going to ask questions, you're going to make somebody's job harder, they're just going to get rid of you. So most of these guys, they knew what time it was. The level, this is a level four yard. They understand politics. They freely gave their phones up, even though they didn't want to. And also, you know, the other thing you guys got to understand is these phones are expensive. It costs two to four thousand dollars to get a cell phone. So that's why a lot of them were like, "Man, this sucks right here." You know, having to give up my cell phone, but they gave them up. Now there was one individual, Thumper from Southside Playboys. I want to say he's from Southgate. I hope I got that right. Thumper from Southside Playboys from Southgate that it wasn't that he didn't give up his phone. It wasn't that he didn't want to give it up. He knew that if that was being asked of him, that he had to give up his cell phone. But his thing was he wanted to make sure that he wasn't being okie doked by the Sureños that came and approached him and told him, you got to give up your cell phone because it wasn't Chato himself that were going to these individuals and telling them you got to give up your phone. He sent a relay, somebody else to, to basically facilitate the message, give up your cell phone or else. 
So when these individuals came to Thumper, Thumper was like, you know, I'm not giving up my phone. You know, I I, I want to, you know, I want to talk to the homie. I want to make sure that that this is legit. You know, let, let, can I get it to homie? And, you know, the way that this guy explained it to me, it's the same thing that's happening out there with, with the NF members that are running around out there on these main lines. These guys got, he called them, he didn't call them details. He called them an entourage. He's like, this guy had an entourage around him. You could not get near him. And he he even said what I said, even the COs would have a problem getting to him because this guy would have like, he said anywhere from seven to 15 individuals, just like a whole pack of sureños that would be around this individual. So when this guy's walking around out there on the yard, you know, Thumper, he wanted to approach him and, and talk to him, but because he's got all this security around him, he couldn't. And I want to say he said that Thumper tried he approached, he tried to approach him on the yard one day and they backed him up. They told him, nah, you know, you can't talk to the homie. You know, unless he wants to talk to you, he'll talk to you. He said, but you can't just walk up and talk to the homie like that. So Thumper, in the meantime, in between time, he still don't give up his cell phone. So, so Thumper, what he does is he gets at the relays and he tells him, hey, look, Por favor. He's like, look, man, can you can you please pass this on to the to the big homie? What Thumper did was he struck up a kite, a respectful kite, just basically asking. He's like, Chato, I'm not trying to, to cause any kind of hindrance. I'm not refusing to give up my cell phone, sir. I understand if I have to give it up, I, I, I will give it up. You know, I will com comply and conform with whatever kind of policies that you know, you guys set, but I just want to make sure with you, sir, can, you know, can you confirm that you're the, you're the one that's asking me to give up my cell phone. So the relays, they take the kite, they go back to Chato and they tell him, look, Hey, this Vato right here, he doesn't want to give up his, his cell phone. You know, we've been asking him for a couple of days already. He struck up a one time for you. He wants you to read. He wants you to check it out. So Chato, he doesn't, he, I, I, I don't know if he read the kite or not. I was going to say he probably just flushed the kite, probably didn't even read it. Probably didn't. But, you know, what he does is he don't want to be bothered with that. This is somebody that is already hindering his program. You know, he set the policies out there and there's somebody that's not compliant. It doesn't matter that this guy just wants to ask. He's debating, he's politicking, and that's something that the Sureños, they don't do, they don't allow. So at that point, what Chato does is he sends two torpedoes at Thumper. And according to this individual that shared this story with me, Thumper wasn't no punk. Thumper was a, a good-sized dude. He's He's been around. He's a lifer. He's doing life and, you know, he's in his cell. And I guess Thumper kind of felt, he felt the tension. He knew that he probably shouldn't have been doing what he, what he was doing, that he should have just complied and tried to get another phone like a lot of the other guys were doing. A lot of the guys that gave up their phone, they gave it up and they were probably trying to get another one on the slunders where nobody would find out. But Thumper chose to go about it his way. And he knew that he was putting himself in harm's way, but he did it anyway. So he felt the tension. He knew they were coming and here they come. So they go up to a cell between an unlock and they open up the door and they blitz them, both of them, both torpedoes. They, they, they run up in there, both of them got bangers. So they start hitting them. All three of them are in there getting off in a small cell. These two guys, both of them are hitting Thumper, but Thumper's fighting back. And like I said, he, you know, he said Thumper wasn't no punk. Thumper had hands. So at one point, Thumper manages to take one of the pedazos away from one of the torpedoes and starts blasting him. So now all three of them, all three of them are, are poked up. By the time it's done, all three of them are poked up. They come out the cell. They spill out of the cell into the day room. So now they're in the day room. The tower sees it. They they prone them out and they take them to the hospital, all three of them. So this is the other thing that started another conversation. 
because these guys ended up failing, basically that was a fail. One of them got their parazo taken and all three of them got stabbed up. It was considered a fail. The other two, the torpedoes, they got deemed as well as Thumper. All three of them got deemed because, again, it was a fail. That opened up some more dialogue. At that point, I asked him a question about, you know, that's the thing. You know, this is a conversation that I've had with a lot of other people. Recently, you notice a lot more homicides that are happening in prison. And there's no doubt in my mind that the NF and the Mexican Mafia and the Aryan Brotherhood are behind a lot of these these, these homicides. And it's because of what they're implementing. They're, they're pushing a hard line out there. The days of running up on somebody, slicing them up, poking them a couple of times, and sending a couple of bombers to get them you know, off the yard, out of the unit, off the tier, whatever, those days are gone. Now they're telling these guys when, when you know, they put a green light on somebody, they're telling them to go in and take their win. They're telling them, go in there and kill this individual. Take his win. If, according to him, if they send two torpedoes or three torpedoes at somebody, they send them at a target, and they don't kill that individual, it's considered a fail. The only way, the only exception is if they're trying to kill this individual, and in the course of that, the gunner ends up shooting somebody, ends up shooting one of them, then they get a pass. But other than that, if they don't kill this individual, it's a fail. That's a hard line to push. Now, I don't know if the NF is pushing that same hard line, but I'm going to tell you right now, the killings have been across the board. And the way these guys have been functioning, I mean, hand in hand, the, and I'm going to get to that part of this as well. It would seem like they would push this as a collective, meaning the Nortenos and the, and the Sureños, all of them. Just rasa. This is a rasa thing. So the way that the impression that I got from him, it's like they're functioning as one big collective out there. But within that collective, the NF members are giving their directives to the Nortenos. And the Mexican Mafia members are giving their directives to the Sureños. But they're act they're acting as a collective. So I don't know if, if the NF is implementing that as well, but when they send torpedoes to, to stab somebody, it doesn't matter who it is, Nortenio, Sureño, they're killing them. So it's a possibility that the NF is pushing that same line. But like I said, that's a hard line to push right there. You know, these, these hits being fails if they're not kills, it's because he said, you know, the reason why, it's because usually back when... You know, back in the days before they let everybody out the shoe, there was checadas, which meant, you know, a lot of the times if they removed somebody or they had somebody hit, it wasn't to try to kill them. It was just to hit them and then to have them sent to the back because they were being requested to the back. Whenever you hear that term, somebody, they want to see somebody in the back or they, they, they're requesting somebody's presence in the back, that means in the oil, in ADSE, in the hole, whatever prison you're talking about. But now, because leadership is no longer in the back, there's no need for that no more. So now they're all kills. The back is right there on the yard with them now. So anyway, he tells me that he ended up running into Chato, you know, a year or two later, and he had a conversation with Chato, and Chato's like, you know what, man, that's fucked up. You know, everything that happened, it's just messed up because, you know, here I am, an active Sureño. I always did everything that was asked to me. I put in work. You know, whenever they, they told me they wanted me to stab somebody, I stabbed them. Whatever they asked of me out there on the yard, I did it as a functioning Sureño. And then I don't give up my cell phone. And I just want to make sure that, you know, it's the brother that's, that's asking for my cell phone. It's not somebody trying to run a scandalous move on me, they're going to hit me. You see the common denominator? He understood at that point that everybody's expendable. So after that incident with Thumper, again, at that point, there was still no Nortenos on that yard in Ironwood. 
those buses would come in due time. But at that point, there was none out there. There was no North Daniels out there programming on that yard. That was one of the prisons, according to him, where North Daniels could not program. If they were to pull up, as soon as they came out, they were rushed. Or the North Daniels, knowing what time it was, they'd end up taking off on somebody. So eventually, the buses pull up. Buses start pulling up with NF members, Hermanos, North Daniels. And my question to him was, well, what was you guys' mindset? How did you guys react to that? Seeing North Daniels actually hit that yard, righteous NF members hit that yard. And his thing was like, bro, we were just, we were captivated by, by everything that was going on. A lot of the times we used to just kind of just fall back and watch and just wait. Because a lot of the times they weren't sure if the North Daniels were going to come out and get off. They didn't know what their real true intentions were. The Mexican mafia seemed to be convinced that the agreement was real, but a lot of the Sureños were uncomfortable. They were like, you know, we don't know how these guys are going to come out here and react. We don't know, you know, if they got an agenda. So they were on pins and needles when the first buses started pulling up. And on that first bus, I want to say that there was two NF members and a bunch of Nortanos that ended up arriving on the same bus. And you know, when they pulled up, they already had standing orders. When these guys get here, you know, I don't want nobody mad dogging. I don't want nobody, I don't want to feel no tension out here on this yard. These guys, you embrace them like brown brothers. Embrace them like raza. If anybody comes at these individuals and they're not brown, you guys defend them. When they get here, you know, we're going to establish the yard and establish the way that it's going to be out here. But in the meantime, I don't want to hear about anybody mad dogging. I don't want to hear about anybody, you know, playing YA games. Give these guys their respect. They deserve that respect. So when these two NF members get there and, you know, the Nortanos, the Hermanos, whoever it was that pulled up with them, they said that they just kind of fell back and they watched them as, you know, they hit the yard. And right away, Chato was, was welcoming. You know, he went over there with his entourage and, the very first day where the NF members got together with Chato, they had their entourages already. This is crazy, entourages. I told you guys how I felt about it in my, you know, in in one of my lives recently about these, these details and these entourages. It just sounds crazy to me. But, you know, maybe they obviously feel like there's a, a, a need for it. I don't know who started it first, the, the South Siders or, or the Mexican Mafia or the, the NF. I don't know. But, you know, maybe it is somewhat necessary if that's the way that they're doing it. If the NF members get there and they see that the Mexican Mafia members, if that's how they're doing it, then they probably got on board and did the same thing. But the one thing I will say and I can understand is that they are definitely targets out there. If something kicks they're going to be the, the first ones that are going to be targeted. So in that sense, I guess I can understand it, but there's not supposed to be none of that. So this first encounter where you had the NF members and their entourages with the Mexican mafia member and his entourage, when they came up, you know, he said everybody was just kind of, everybody was on pins and needles wondering what was going to happen. Are they going to get off? Are they going to start throwing? Are they going to start boxing? Somebody going to, bust out with the bang or start stabbing somebody. Nobody really knew what was going to happen. A lot of guys were, you know, they weren't allowed to be a part of that. They weren't really privy to the internal workings of what was going on. Only Chato and his inner circle really knew what was going on. All these other guys are on the outside looking in. You know, this guy was part of their internal leadership. Even though they were convinced that the agreement to end hostilities was real, when they had this first conversation, it was like, I guess they were talking and, and one of the NF members kind of like just moved his hand and they thought right there that that's, it was going to kick. But once they shook hands and everything was, was all gravy, then from that point on, they just started programming. And for the first couple of days, things were kind of funny. As you guys can imagine, you know, we've been at war for the last 50 something years and now everything just kind of stops and we're out there with people that used to be mortal enemies. 
So it was kind of kind of weird in the beginning and things over time, it just started to come together and the, the carnalismo and the respect was there tenfold because everybody really wanted to go that extra mile and show the other the other side that, you know, we're real about this disagreement to end hostility. So if anybody got caught mad dogging or somebody got caught doing something, they just blast them. They blast them as a showing, you know, as, as a way of showing that, hey, we're dead serious about this. And that's what they were doing. Now, you know, the other thing that I just found kind of crazy is that, you know, the way that it looks like they're functioning out there now is racial lines. There's racial lines out there now. It's no longer North and South. It's brown against black or black against white or white against brown or white against black. That's how it is out there. They have standing orders, the Nortenos and the Sureños, to protect each other. If something happens on the yard with the Norteño and the Africano, they're, the Sureños are mandated to defend the Norteños and vice versa. That's crazy. That's crazy. The, the politics have, have flipped completely from what it was when I was out there. But they have orders to get off together. They have, you know, Norteños and Sureños that are selling up together. Well, you guys know a lot of that stuff. But a lot of this stuff that was, you know, leadership based, that's the stuff I really thought you guys might want to hear about. You know, the other thing that we talked about that was kind of crazy is like, you know, gang banging is it's nothing like it used to be. Obviously, we all know that. But now, you know, like out there in, in L.A., this well, the conversation came up because, you know, he was saying that this agreement to end hostilities has extended out to the streets. And I wasn't really in agreement with that. I told him, you know what, I hear what you're saying, but me, myself, personally, I don't think I would feel too comfortable walking out there in Compton or in Watts or out there, you know, by Florencia. East LA somewhere flamed up and thinking that everything's all good, that that extends to the streets. I don't think so. And he kind of laughed at that. He, you know, so obviously he understood what I was talking about. There's a lot of Sureños out there, young Sureños in their hood. They're still, you know, if they get an opportunity to take a Norteño down out there on the streets in LA, they're going to get it in. Just like Norteños out in Northern California. They're going to get it in if they get the opportunity. It's a little different out there on the streets because, you know, there's a lot more latitude. They're not directly up under leadership. You can get away with stuff out there. So I don't believe that the, it, it's that real to where people are really enforcing it out there on the streets. Now, you know, the other thing that he said was kind of kind of funny, and it's true. I just never really thought about it. He said, you know what? You know what's different now, Box? He was like, you know, back in the 90s when you were out there gangbanging, when you pulled up into a, an adversary's or an op's neighborhood and you jumped out on them, what did you ask them? What was, what, what was the first thing that you would ask? And I answered, where are you from? And he said, exactly. He goes, nowadays, today, this day right now, he goes, they're not asking that no more. He goes, when you pull up into somebody's neighborhood or you see an op, a potential op, you know what it is that they're saying now? And I already knew where he was going. I was like, yeah, I do. And he was like, what's that? And I said, are you active? And he started laughing. He's like, exactly. That's what they're doing now. That's how much gang banging has changed. It's no longer where you're from, what hoods you're from. It's whether you're active or not, because that's what the war is based on now, whether you're active or whether you're a dropout. That's crazy. But anyways, before I close this up, you know, in talking to him, he's going to share more stories with me. But I just want you guys to know, again, this is your disclaimer right here. A lot of these stories that he talks about, you know, I wasn't there. I can't stamp them. But I did have a conversation with him and I, and I let him know, look, man, my credibility on my channel means everything to me. So the only thing that I ask you, and there's no incentive for him to be sharing these stories with me. I'm not paying him or nothing like that. This is just stuff that he's freely or freely talking about. So he doesn't have an incentive 
to lie and to fabricate a story. These are things that he's been through. He told me that, you know, the, the next story that he's going to give me is going to be a banger. And it's going to be about, you know, this policy now that they have about killing your target or being considered a fail. So that's what the next story is going to be based on. We'll see what, what it is. He's got a lot of stories that he knows about active Mexican mafia members that are still active today and things that have happened in the past. So we're going to get into it and see what kind of things he comes up with. Anyways, this was a quick one. I just wanted to run this short one with you guys. You know, this was something that was interesting to me because I always wondered how the Sureños, you know, what their mindset was when all this stuff was going on out there. How it was when the first buses pulled up to the yards. You know, how those conversations took place between some of the leaders out there, some of the politics that were taking place out there on the yard. And it sounds like a lot of it, it sounds like a lot of the things that were happening within the NF and the North Daniels were exactly the same things were happening with the Mexican Mafia and the Sureños. The only thing that was different was geography. <laughs> some of them came from Northern California. Some of them came from Southern California. But the politics remain the same across the board. That's crazy now. It's crazy. And it's just, I'm still trying to wrap my head around this whole thing of them guys being out there together, selling up together, throwing spreads. They're like, they're hyped up on this whole peace treaty thing. And again, they're running around on the yards like, seriously, they got each other's backs. And if something kicks off, is the Norteños, the Sureños, the NF, Mexican Mafia members against whoever it is. It's crazy how much times have changed. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. Hopefully, I'll be back with another one tomorrow or sometime this week when he calls. But anyways, with that being said, I got a premiere coming out tonight. I don't know if this video is going to drop before or after. We'll see. This your boy, B, and I'm out.